A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John, the sixth chapter. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of God will give you. For it is on Jesus that God the Creator has set God's seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in Jesus whom God has sent. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then so that we may believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is the creator who gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace to you and peace in the name of the God who loves us one and all. My name is Adam Snook and I serve as an assistant to the bishop in the Eastern Synod of our Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. And it's an absolute joy to be part of this year's Summer Sermon Series. I'd like you to imagine a humble loaf of bread, simple and plain. For the better part of her 89 years, my grandmother began nearly every day baking eight loaves of bread. Of course, in her later years, the abundant excess was shared between appreciative neighbors and eager children. But at the outset, that bread served a very different purpose, an essential purpose. It was used to feed her 12 children, half a loaf per child, with a bit extra for herself as well as any guests that may pop by to visit. Growing up in a poor and fairly isolated community in southeastern Newfoundland, bread was one of the only staples that could be counted on in my grandmother's house. Early each morning before the sun had risen, she would set to work. And by the time my mother and her 11 siblings would open their eyes, the smell of fresh baking bread would begin to waft its way through the upper level of their clapboard-sided home. Perhaps you can also call similar spells or memories. It all sounds very quaint, doesn't it? Charming, old-fashioned, even. But there's another side to this nostalgic story, that moment when the bread would run out. The other older kids noticed especially, though I suspect that it likely affected them all. Because as the day faded, so did the supply of bread until eventually the cupboard was bare. And with little else to fill the void, that hunger returned, gnawing, growling, aching, pestering. My uncle, uncle can clearly remember his evening prayers. Dear God, please put bread in the pan and from there put bread in our bellies. Appropriate, if nothing else. This morning's gospel reading follows immediately on the heels of Jesus feeding the multitude with only five loaves of barley bread and two fish the story which we dwelt with last Sunday. 5,000 men plus women and children gathered near to Jesus as he taught them. But when their stomachs begin to grumble and gurgle, it didn't take long for panic to set in amongst the disciples. 
Where on earth are we going to get enough food to feed all these people? Or perhaps even worse yet, how are we going to afford it? But Jesus quickly speaks the promise of abundance into the midst of their scarcity. He takes those five unimpressive loaves and he takes those two measly fish and then he multiplies them so that every person could be satisfied. In fact, as John tells us, there were even 12 baskets of leftovers collected from those who had already eaten their fill. I like to imagine that they all slept pretty soundly that night with content hearts and full bellies. But it didn't take long for that old familiar hunger to return. In fact, and by the very next morning, that which once had provided so much satisfaction had subsided. The growling returned, the gnawing resumed, the aching reappeared, and that pestering pit in their physical stomachs began to beg to be satisfied once more. Unfortunately, however, and unlike the routine in my grandmother's house, the wafting smell of fresh-baked bread was nowhere to be smelt. In fact, Jesus was also nowhere to be seen. And so they did only what was reasonable. In fact, they did precisely what I would expect for them to have done. They got back into their boats and they started to search again. They started to search as this morning's psalm proclaims for a God who was capable of providing that for which they craved. Does that sound familiar? I suspect it might. Because I believe that it's at precisely this point in the story that our collective experiences intersect that of those who yearn for manna in the wilderness and of those who hungered for bread the very next morning. To put it another way, we too are hungry. We're starving. The world is aching. We too are searching for something, anything to fill the empty void. The problem, of course, is that at first glance, there appears to be all sorts of bread upon which we can feast. The bread of wealth, the loaf of power, a slice of popularity, the crumbs of material goods. All of these come with big and bold claims promising to ease that ravaging need which rages inside of God's But sooner or later, whether it be the next morning or the next day or even the next week, that hunger will return. There comes a time when the bread of this world just won't cut it anymore. And in that moment, we also return to our boats and we too resume our search. And so no, we who have eaten today may not quite understand the depths of human hunger that a piece of physical bread can satisfy. Thankfully, there is very little of my mother and her siblings' experience that I can truthfully understand. But I do know, we do know, what it is like to hunger, to need something. I am convinced that God uses toddlers to teach us some of faith's most important lessons. As a parent, I have always upheld the try it rule. Whether at home or away, my son has been encouraged to give new things a try. And for the most part, Nate does pretty well with this rule. But when he turned about three or four, he started to hone his skills a little bit. Oh, he'd try everything, of course taking the tiniest bites humanly possible. But then he'd resume eating only those items that he actually enjoyed eating. Carrots, peas, and meat were typically rejected for more appealing options. Until he would finally firmly announce that he was full 
and go back to whatever it was that was waiting for him. You know what happened next. Of course you do. Because nine times out of ten, the dishes were barely cleared when I would inevitably hear, Daddy, I'm hungry. But here's the thing. There was never a time when I refused to satisfy the hunger. Certainly, and often, it meant cozying back up to those carrots that didn't quite make the cut previously. Or the peas. Other times, it meant a snack to fill the void. But always, always, he knew that when he turned to his parent, that he would be fed. The hearty and fulfilling good news, dear friends, is that we also have a God whose love meets us again and again and again in the midst of our needs as well. For when we find ourselves hungering for peace amidst the racing and tumultuous nature of this world, it is God who gives us a moment of rest. And when we hunger for healing amidst illness and disease, it is God who sits with us and comforts us while we wait. And when we hunger for community and connectedness, it is God who unites us into one connected body, into one community. Fractured, broken, imperfect though we may be, God hears our cries and God gives us hope. For when we ached for forgiveness, God tore open the heavens. When we were starved for direction, Christ stooped to wash his friend's feet. And when we yearned to know that we were loved beyond all measure, it was an empty grave that whispered God's ever-satisfying grace and God's ceaselessly satiating love into our lives forever, for all. Imagine a humble loaf of bread, simple, and yet when our hunger pangs throb deeper than the bread of this world can truly satisfy, when we return to our boats and resume our search, may we find true fulfillment only in God who has sent manna into our wilderness, manna in the form of Jesus, the bread of life. Come all who are hungry, for the feast has begun. Thanks be to God.